In the midst of the 20th century, as the world teetered on the precipice of another global war, an insidious force began to solidify its grasp on Nazi Germany, the Schutzstaffel, more notoriously known as the SS. Established in 1925, initially serving as Adolf Hitler's personal bodyguards, this dark unit would metamorphose into one of the most ruthless and formidable paramilitary organizations the world had ever witnessed. Under the chilling leadership of Heinrich Himmler, the SS expanded its dominion, becoming not just the Führer's protective shield, but also the executioner's blade. The dreaded Waffen-SS, the military branch of the organization, spread terror on battlefields, while the SS's death's head units zealously guarded concentration and extermination camps, enacting some of history's most horrific genocides. Yet who were the men behind these black uniforms adorned with death's head insignias? And what drove them to partake in, and oftentimes revel in, such atrocities? Recall the gut-wrenching tales from Auschwitz, Sobibor and Treblinka. These were not just camps, but factories of death, where millions met their grim fate at the hands of the SS. With methods ranging from forced labor to systematic extermination, the SS demonstrated a brutal efficiency in carrying out Hitler's final solution. As we tread this harrowing path, we echo the words of Primo Levi. Monsters exist, but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the common men. Join us as we pull back the curtain on the Schutzstaffel, unearthing the grim reality that lurked behind their black uniforms and death's head insignia. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. The Shadow Squads, the unsettling ascent of the SS. In the swirling chaos of Weimar Germany, where political instability and social unrest were as common as the morning paper, emerged a force that would eclipse all others in terms of ruthlessness and impact. The Schutzstaffel, better known as the SS, Originating in 1925 as a mere detachment of the SA, Sturmab Teilung, or Storm Detachment, the SS was initially conceived as a personal bodyguard unit for Adolf Hitler and other top Nazi officials. Led by Julius Schreck and comprising just eight men, this entity had humble beginnings indeed. Yet, in the crucible of ambition and ideology, these eight men were the seeds of what would become a sprawling, merciless machine. The transformation of the SS from bodyguards to architects of genocide took several pivotal turns, each adding another layer of complexity and power to the organization. Heinrich Himmler, a man as unassuming as he was cruel, took over as its leader in 1929. Under his watch, the SS metamorphosed into a veritable state within a state. It expanded its size, took on intelligence operations, and began the internal policing of the Nazi party itself. By 1933, when the Nazis came to power, the SS had its own intelligence wing, the SD or Sicherheitsdienst. Amidst the bloody purges of 1934 known as the Night of the Long Knives, the SS showed its fangs. Their orchestration of the extrajudicial killings of the SA leadership left no doubt about the lengths to which they would go to secure power. The massacre was a pivotal moment, severing the SS from the SA and making it an independent organization answerable only to Hitler. That very independence was unprecedented, setting the stage for the unchecked atrocities that were to follow. Berlin, the heart of Germany, became the SS's operational epicenter, where men in crisp black uniforms walked with a chilling air of self-assuredness. These were not mere soldiers or even standard officers. They were ideologically motivated elites, cherry-picked for their Aryan characteristics and unwavering loyalty to the Nazi doctrine. Places like the Wevelsberg Castle, a Renaissance fortress Himmler envisioned as the SS's ideological and spiritual hub, became centers for training that combined military rigor with arcane rituals and ideological indoctrination. By the time the Nuremberg Laws were enacted in 1935, the SS had become a key tool for enforcing racial policies. They didn't just protect Hitler, they were now guardians of the entire Nazi worldview, obsessed with the purity of German blood and culture. The 1936 Olympics served as an international platform to showcase the might and efficiency of the SS, but beneath the veneer of disciplined pageantry 
lay darker ambitions. Their role escalated dramatically with the outbreak of World War II. No longer just an internal force, they took on military and extermination roles. The formation of the Waffen-SS, an armed wing, enabled them to participate in battles, while units like the Einsatzgruppen were explicitly designed for mass murder. As the war progressed, the SS delved into increasingly sadistic pursuits, from human experiments in concentration camps to overseeing the final solution, the mass extermination of Jews. Notoriously secretive, they even created their own coded language known as SS Sprach, a lexicon that veiled the brutality of their deeds with bureaucratic detachment. Cogs in the machine, the Byzantine network of SS labyrinths. If you've ever tried solving a Rubik's Cube, you may have gotten a taste of how complex systems work. Each move changes the landscape, each twist contributes to the overall configuration. Now, take that complexity and multiply it by the weight of history and horror, and you'll come close to understanding the intricate organizational structure of the SS, or the Schutzstaffel. The SS was not a monolithic entity, it was a chimeric labyrinth of subgroups and special units, each with its own function, ethos and chain of command. To delve into this labyrinth, one has to first navigate through its overarching divisions, the Allgemeine SS, the Waffen SS, and the SS Totenkopfverbande. The Allgemeine SS, also known as the General SS, was the most extensive division. By the mid-1930s, with the passage of the Nuremberg Laws, this arm of the SS had essentially become a parallel police force, eclipsing the regular German police in both authority and power. But there was a catch members had to trace their genealogy back to 1750 to prove their Aryan heritage, a stipulation that took genealogical obsession to new levels. While we might casually wonder about our family trees, for the Allgemeine SS, genealogy was a matter of ideological purity, a rite of passage to partake in the enforcement of the Aryan utopia. Then came the Waffen SS, the armed military branch of the SS that sprung to life after the outbreak of World War II. Unlike the Allgemeine SS, the Waffen SS was subject to the OKEW, the high command of the German army, albeit while answering ultimately to Heinrich Himmler. More pragmatic in its recruitment, it even incorporated volunteers from other European nations, albeit usually from Nazi-occupied or aligned territories. Known for their fearsome combat prowess and ferocious panzer divisions, the Waffen SS wore camouflaged uniforms distinct from the Wehrmacht's plain greys. These uniforms were so iconic that they became part of the Waffen-SS mystique, a sartorial declaration of their elite status. And let's not forget their distinct salute. Instead of the traditional German army salute, they used the Hitler salute as an affirmation of their primary loyalty to the Führer. Finally, we reach the SS Totenkopf Verbande, the Death's Head Units, responsible for administering the concentration and extermination camps. Commanded by officers who came up through the Allgemeine SS, they became a separate division in 1939. It's curious and grotesque that the symbol of a skull and crossbones was a symbol worn on their collar patches, a grim foreshadowing of the death they would administer. These units weren't just jailers, they were executors of a systematized death machine, bureaucrats of horror, who counted calories allotted to prisoners the way a cruel dietitian might, each calculation a step closer to the annihilation of inmates through forced labor and malnutrition. Like a dark tapestry woven with threads of ambition, ideology and brutality, the internal structure of the SS was a feat of organizational engineering. It's easy to picture Heinrich Himmler, the quiet fanatic, meticulously plotting out this web of power, his office filled with detailed charts architectural blueprints for camps, and historical tomes on Germanic law. His famous phrase, my honor is loyalty, wasn't just an oath. It was a design principle for the complex, multifaceted monstrosity that was the SS. Invisible ink, the indelible unspoken crimes of the SS in the Holocaust. It was the pen that inked the map to hell, a quiet signature by Heinrich Himmler, setting into motion Operation Reinhard, the plan that would establish extermination camps like Treblinka, Sobibor and Belzec. It's almost unfathomable to imagine that such boundless horror could be reduced to bureaucratic banalities, to typewriter clicks and ink stains. 
Yet that's exactly how the SS orchestrated their grim ballet of death, with calculated detachment and meticulous planning. The Holocaust was not just an outpouring of chaotic hatred, it was a systematically designed and efficiently executed genocide, with the SS at its core. Often unspoken in public discourses is the haunting reality that the SS played a multifaceted role in the Holocaust. They were not just executors, but architects. Take the Einsatzgruppen, for example, mobile killing squads that moved like vengeful shadows behind the advancing German army, tasked with murdering Jews, Romani and other groups. Armed with lists prepared well in advance, they would enter towns with a mission to purify. At places like Babi Yar, near Kiev, they slaughtered over 33,000 Jews in just two days. Their reports, documented in chilling bureaucratic language, would be sent back to Berlin as if they were filing business expenses instead of accounting for mass murder. The SS Totenkopfverband oversaw the concentration camps and extermination centers, but these death's head units were not merely custodians of death, they were cultivators. Auschwitz, a name that has become synonymous with the Holocaust, was under their watch. Auschwitz wasn't just a place where lives were ended, it was a perverse laboratory where medical experiments took place, often spearheaded by SS doctors like Josef Mengele. Here, the Nazis' perverse fascination with eugenics found a dark playground. From sterilization experiments to studies that led to incalculable suffering, the SS presided over an empire of scientific sadism. Even the Zyklon B gas used in the chambers had its deployment overseen by SS personnel, men who would later insist they were simply following orders. Then there were the transports, the long soul-crushing journeys that delivered millions to their deaths. The Reichssicherheitshauptamt, or the Reich Main Security Office, was an SS-controlled body responsible for coordinating the mass deportations to extermination camps. These were not arbitrary assignments, they were orchestrated with cruel precision. Names were ticked off lists, as families were torn apart and crammed into cattle cars, often spending days in unimaginable conditions. The SS officers who met these trains upon arrival implemented what they chillingly termed the selection process, deciding who would be put to immediate death and who would be temporarily spared for labor or experiments. Heinrich Himmler, speaking to a gathering of SS officers in 1943, famously said, This is a page of glory in our history, which has never been written and is never to be written. He referred to the mass extermination of Jews, a topic so vile that even among his inner circle, it was often only discussed in veiled euphemisms. The quiet conjurer, Heinrich Himmler, the puppeteer behind the SS marionette. Heinrich Himmler was not an imposing figure at first glance. With his glasses perched precariously on his nose and a demeanor that could be mistaken for a mild-mannered librarian rather than a merciless killer, he would not strike you as the mastermind behind some of history's most horrific crimes. Yet it's often said that still waters run deep and Himmler's stillness concealed an abyss of unfathomable darkness. Himmler was a man driven by twisted ideologies but he was also a man who paid close attention to details. In his world, the devil wasn't just in the details, the devil was the details. It was Himmler who saw the SS not just as an organization, but as a chivalric order, a dark brotherhood bound together by a perverse sense of loyalty and a twisted vision for the future. He took inspiration from medieval Teutonic Knights, seeing himself as a modern day crusader defending the Aryan race. You could almost imagine him in a different era, poring over scrolls and manuscripts. In fact, Himmler even created the Arnenerbe, an SS think tank, to delve into archaeological and cultural research to legitimize Nazi ideology. The Arnenerbe organized expeditions to far-flung places like Tibet in search of Aryan roots, as if history itself could be rewritten with a spade and a brush. Yet it was in the realms of terror and control that Himmler truly made his mark. The Gestapo, the secret police, and the Sicherheitsdienst, the intelligence agency, were brought under his domain, making him the second most powerful man in Germany. His reach was not limited to the realm of the abstract or the secretive. It was Himmler who organized the mass extermination camps, who coordinated the Einsatzgruppen, 
the mobile killing squads that followed the Wehrmacht into the Eastern Front. He was as much a bureaucrat as he was an executioner. Under his orders, minutes of meetings were kept, details were recorded, and statistics were maintained. This meticulous record-keeping made the Holocaust not just an atrocity, but a bureaucratically administered atrocity. If ever there was a testament to Himmler's dual nature, part ideologue, part administrator, it was the infamous Posen speeches of 1943. Here, speaking before a gathering of SS leaders, Himmler uncharacteristically laid bare the scale and scope of the Holocaust, calling it a page of glory that would never be written. It's haunting to think that Himmler saw glory in orchestrated death and considered it a subject not just for whispered conversations, but for a kind of demented statecraft. It was also Himmler who, realizing that Germany's defeat was imminent, tried to negotiate with the Allies in 1945, even going so far as to meet with Count Volker Bernadotte of Sweden. The man who had orchestrated death on an unimaginable scale was now seeking to be a broker of life, as if such a thing were within his moral purview. These actions led to his arrest by British forces, and shortly afterward, realizing the noose of justice was tightening, he took cyanide to evade facing the reckoning he so richly deserved. The poisoned chalice, how ideological elixirs nurtured the SS's dark crusade. Imagine an assembly of men their eyes glowing with a fervor that defies simple explanation, gathered in ancient castles, replete with medieval symbolism. No, this isn't a clandestine meeting of a secret society from a Dan Brown novel. This was the Voivelsberg Castle, the ideological and spiritual center for the SS, where Heinrich Himmler envisioned rekindling the ancient chivalry of Teutonic knights, but marinated in a toxic brew of Nazi ideology. In these chambers filled with twisted takes on Germanic folklore and distorted historical artifacts, the SS wasn't just born, it was baptized and indoctrinated, fed not just with food for the body, but poison for the soul. The ideological indoctrination of the SS began long before they set foot in Wevelsberg Castle. Their initiation rituals bore the hallmarks of a twisted, chivalric brotherhood. Recruits had to prove their Aryan ancestry up to the year 1750, as if purity of blood could somehow translate to nobility of purpose. And then came the oath, an eternal loyalty to Adolf Hitler and to Heinrich Himmler, who, in his role as Reichsführer SS, played the part of Grandmaster in this perverse reimagining of a knightly order. With oaths sworn and daggers adorned with SS runes in hand, these men had not merely joined an organization, they had enlisted in a dark crusade an unholy mission sanctioned by a contorted ideology. It's one thing to join an organization, and quite another to internalize its doctrines. The SS training went far beyond physical conditioning and military strategy. It included a heavy dose of ideological education. SS schools, such as the SS Junkerschulen, became the crucibles, where ideology was infused into the very marrow of the recruits. They learned to see themselves as the vanguard of the master race, ordained to impose a new order based on racial purity and authoritarian rule. Subjects like racial science were taught, where dubious theories were laid as factual bases for deep-seated prejudices. Myths, legends, and deliberately distorted interpretations of history were incorporated into the curriculum, designed to reinforce the notion of Aryan supremacy. It was a schooling in fanaticism, a university of hatred, then came the field exercises, but these were not mere war games. In occupied territories, the Einsatzgruppen, composed mainly of SS officers, practiced what they had been taught. They were graded not just on tactical brilliance, but also on ideological purity, evaluated on how efficiently they could execute the racial policies of extermination and displacement. It was an internship in atrocity, a hands-on course in subjugation, and they were quick learners. The best political weapon is the weapon of terror, Heinrich Himmler once observed, imparting this wisdom to his SS officers. The concept of Weltanschauungskrieg, or ideological warfare, was deeply ingrained into SS ideology. This went beyond mere propaganda. It was an outlook that allowed them to commit unthinkable acts without a flicker of doubt 
or an iota of compassion. They became true believers, men who thought they were participating in a grand historical mission. For them, the SS was not merely an assignment, it was an anointment. The many-headed Hydra, the sinister versatility of the SS. Picture a Hydra, its multiple heads writhing, each functioning independently, yet part of a monstrous whole. This was the SS during World War II, an organization with manifold roles, each disturbingly efficient in its own right. It's as if the SS was designed to be a Swiss army knife of horror, each function carefully honed to inflict maximum damage. No role was too large or too small, no mission too lofty or too lowly, as long as it furthered the cause of the Reich. When the curtain of conflict rose in September 1939, the SS was already a well-oiled machine of oppression within Germany, but the war offered it new theatres of operation. In Poland, the Einsatzgruppen, special SS killing squads, served as harbingers of a broader European tragedy. Initially tasked with eliminating political and intellectual leaders to decapitate Polish society, they would soon play a pivotal role in the Holocaust, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of Jews and others. These were not faceless soldiers pulling triggers. These were men who attended lectures on racial purity, who carried small books containing the tenets of their toxic ideology in their uniform pockets, as if they were holy texts justifying their unholy acts. Yet the SS was not content to merely be the sword. It also sought to be the shield of the Nazi regime. It was behind the internal policing that kept the German populace in line, enforcing ideological conformity and quashing dissent. The Gestapo, or the secret state police, operated under the broader umbrella of the SS, rooting out enemies of the state with chilling efficiency. The simple act of listening to a foreign radio station could lead to a knock on the door, a knock that heralded disappearance, interrogation or worse. Every aspect of life was under scrutiny, every deviation a potential threat, and the SS served as the all-seeing eye, watching, judging, and often executing. And then there were the concentration camps, a grotesque universe unto themselves, operated with an industrial efficiency that belied the chaos of human suffering within. It was the SS that ran these camps through its SS Totenkopfverbande, or Death's Head units. They were responsible for everything from the trains that arrived packed with terrified human cargo to the orchestration of forced labor and systematic extermination. Dachau, Auschwitz, Sobibor, names that still send chills down our spines, were managed as if they were factories, their raw material being human lives and their end product being death. The SS personnel who managed these camps often lived with their families in residences just beyond the barbed wire, as if managing annihilation was a nine-to-five job that didn't interfere with domestic life. The eyes of the world are upon you, Eisenhower told his troops on D-Day, but the eyes of the SS were focused elsewhere, on a secret plan to evacuate and destroy concentration camps to hide their crimes, on pockets of resistance that still needed quelling, and, towards the end, on futile last stands against a tide that had turned. Even as their world crumbled, the SS remained fanatically devoted to their cause, fighting to the last bullet and in some instances, participating in the organized destruction of evidence of their own crimes. The abyss beyond the uniform, a dark odyssey, through the war crimes of the SS. Imagine for a moment an organization so enmeshed in cruelty that it turned the unimaginable into the routine. Picture SS officers, who looked like any other soldiers, uniforms pressed, boots polished, insignia gleaming, but whose actions were from the furthest depths of human malevolence. The war crimes of the SS weren't mere aberrations. They were systematized horrors that unfolded like a slow-moving, inexorable dark cloud across the landscape of Europe. Let's begin with the Einsatzgruppen, the notorious mobile killing squads. They were the SS's lethal pioneers in the Eastern Front, following in the wake of advancing German troops. In places like Babi Yar near Kiev, these squads massacred tens of thousands of Jews, Romani people, and others deemed undesirable. These weren't abstract numbers, they were men and women. The executions were so massive that the ground would ripple, a grotesque phenomenon caused by the settling of the mass graves. 
but mass murder was just one grotesque hue in a chilling spectrum of atrocities. The SS played an instrumental role in the exploitation of forced labor. Industries like IG Farben, Krupp, and even Volkswagen made use of laborers who were worked to death under SS supervision. These were the hands that built the Third Reich, but they were shackled hands, starved and exhausted. Men like Oswald Pohl, the chief of the SS's economic and administrative office, meticulously managed these horrors as though they were merely lines in a ledger, disregarding the human cost. And then there were the medical experiments, acts so vile they seemed to belong in a realm beyond human comprehension. Dr. Josef Mengele at Auschwitz became a figure synonymous with this dark science, conducting experiments that ranged from sterilization to the study of twins, often leading to their deaths. The experiments were sadistic, bereft of scientific value, and were predicated entirely on human suffering. A quote attributed to Mengele reveals the cold detachment. The more we do to you, the less you seem to believe we are doing it. Another chapter in this dreadful litany is the SS's engagement in hostage-taking and reprisal killings. Towns like orador sur glane in France and Lidish in Czechoslovakia were wiped off the map as acts of collective punishment. Men and women were killed, their homes burned, their histories obliterated. The SS didn't merely want to subjugate, they aimed to erase, to deny entire communities their place in the human narrative. Lest we think that this darkness was confined to a few depraved souls, consider the Jaeger Report, an internal SS document detailing the mass murders conducted by one Einsatzkommando unit in Lithuania. The report chillingly tabulates the number of people killed, broken down by category, men, women, seniors, as if they were mere statistics. This was the bureaucracy of evil, a systematized annihilation managed with the kind of meticulousness one might associate with a corporate annual report. Scales of Justice, the Twilight Reckoning of the SS. If the war was a sprawling, grisly tapestry of human suffering, then the post-war trials were an attempt, however inadequate, to weave a narrative of justice into a fabric stained by indelible atrocities. The Nuremberg Trials, which commenced in November 1945, became the most emblematic of these judicial quests, setting the stage for a global reckoning that transcended mere revenge. In the Grand Chamber, where the echoes of countless voices reverberated off wood-panelled walls and plush velvet curtains, men who once orchestrated crimes of an incomprehensible scale were now the defendants. Among them was Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the highest-ranking SS officer to face judgment at Nuremberg. The sight of this man, who had overseen much of the Holocaust as the chief of the Reich Main Security Office, attempting to justify himself, was an exercise in absurdity. His eventual sentencing to death by hanging was a moment both satisfying and disturbing. Satisfying because justice seemed to have been done, yet disturbing because the punishment could never be commensurate with the crimes. The Nuremberg trials would set the precedent for the legal principle of command responsibility where senior officers could be held responsible for crimes committed by subordinates if they had knowledge and did not act to prevent them. This principle would be invoked again and again in subsequent trials of SS officers and personnel, both in Germany and abroad. But what about the foot soldiers, the rank and file of the SS? The fate of those men would unfold in smaller courtrooms across Europe and the Americas, stretching over decades, even into the 21st century. In 1961, Adolf Eichmann, the logistical architect behind the mass deportations to extermination camps, was captured in Argentina by Israeli agents. His trial in Jerusalem, which was broadcast globally, etched into collective memory the banality of evil, a phrase coined by political theorist Hannah Arendt. Eichmann, who described himself as a mere cog in the machine, was executed in 1962 leaving the world to ponder the horrifying idea that mass murder could be the work of bureaucrats dutifully ticking off checklists. Further trials would also include other kinds of accountability, not merely retribution, but also restitution. The Luxembourg Agreement of 1952 was a landmark deal that compelled West Germany to pay reparations to Israel and to the Jewish people. A financial acknowledgement, however inadequate, 
of the horrors perpetrated by entities like the SS. Curiously, not all SS members faced the trials. Take the case of Dr. Josef Mengele, the Angel of Death, from Auschwitz. Despite the relentless pursuit by Mossad and other agencies, he eluded capture, living out his days in South America before dying in a swimming accident in 1979. His escape was an uncomfortable reminder that the long arm of justice, though expansive, had its limitations. Then there were those like Otto Skorzeny, an SS Obersturmbahnführer famed for rescuing Benito Mussolini from captivity. Although acquitted at Nuremberg, he became involved in post-war underground organizations and was even consulted by some intelligence agencies, leaving one to ponder the disquieting elasticity of morality in the corridors of power. Soldiers of the Fringe, the paradox of foreign volunteers in the Waffen-SS. As the drama of World War II unfolded like a grim tapestry across Europe, a peculiar subplot was taking form, often unnoticed, away from the main narrative dominated by the Wehrmacht and the Nazis' inner circles. This is the strange paradoxical tale of foreign volunteers in the Waffen-SS, a tale that dances on the edges of allegiance and survival, identity and pragmatism. The recruitment of foreign volunteers into the Waffen-SS began in earnest around 1941. Already, the machine of war was churning through Europe and fresh soldiers were in high demand. In a twist of irony, the racially fixated SS opened its ranks to what it had once considered inferior groups. The logic was coldly utilitarian, manpower was waning, and political alliances were forged in quicksand. From the Finns in the north to the French Charlemagne division, from the Ukrainian Galicia division to the volunteers from the Balkans, the fabric of the Waffen SS was becoming a complex weave of ethnicities and nationalities. Now, one might wonder, what drove these men to join an organization notorious for its ruthless ideological zeal? For some, it was a mixture of anti-communist sentiments and the allure of a new Europe under Nazi auspices. Men like Leon de Grel, a Belgian political activist turned Waffen SS volunteer, viewed the fight as an extension of their own nationalist struggles. In one of his speeches, de Grel brazenly declared, I am leaving, take care of Belgium. I remain a Walloon and remain Belgian, but I will fight on the Eastern Front as a European. For others, joining the Waffen SS was a desperate gambit for survival or better treatment under occupation. Yet others were swayed by propaganda, their minds festooned with images of valiant warriors fighting for a greater cause. SS recruiters, fully aware of the volatile ingredients they were mixing, used targeted propaganda materials like pamphlets written in various languages and films that tapped into local folklore and history. These methods fed into the complex web of motivations, making each foreign division a curious blend of ideologies and intentions. As these volunteers were integrated, or some might argue, absorbed into the Waffen SS, they underwent intense training sessions aimed at molding them into the archetypal SS soldier. But the reality was far more nuanced. Despite wearing similar uniforms adorned with the infamous Death's Head insignia, many foreign units were ill-equipped and received fewer privileges than their German counterparts. The fighting they saw was no less brutal, often deployed in some of the war's most horrific theatres, be it the frozen labyrinth of the Eastern Front or the collapsing bulwarks in France during the Allied invasion. As the war waned and the tides turned, these foreign volunteers found themselves entrapped in a collapsing empire. Some, like the remnants of the French Charlemagne division, faced the gruesome battle for Berlin, fighting to the bitter end in a city already consigned to ruins. Others tried to flee back to their homelands, only to be met with various fates, trials, executions or a lifetime of ostracization. In the shadow of ruins, the occult and aesthetic anatomy of the SS, in the annals of dark history, few symbols have evoked as much horror and disdain as the twin runes of the SS. These sigils, resembling twin bolts of lightning, stood for more than just two letters. They were the alchemical formula that fused myth, mysticism and malice into a single chilling brand. Heinrich Himmler, 
a man as intrigued by the arcane as he was by the art of extermination, envisioned the SS not merely as a military unit, but as an esoteric order, grounded in a dark pastiche of Aryan myths, Teutonic legends, and convoluted pseudoscience. Himmler was captivated by the idea of reviving an ancient Aryan heritage, rich with warrior codes, secret rituals, and sacred symbols. His ideology, as esoteric as it was maniacal, drew inspiration from various occult practices and rune lore. It's said that he often visited the Wevelsberg Castle, a place he intended to make the Camelot of the SS, where he is believed to have indulged in a variety of mystical ceremonies. The double runes weren't mere affectations. They were carefully selected from the Armenon runes, a set popularized by Austrian mysticist Guido von Liszt. Liszt's work was considered an esoteric interpretation of the old Norse runic alphabets, though it was far from historically accurate. Still, Himmler and his inner circle were enamored by the mystique that surrounded this esoteric symbol, interpreting it as a symbol of dualism, creation and destruction, life and death, power and duty. It is as if they believed that by donning these sigils, they could channel some cosmic energy that would legitimize their acts of unprecedented violence. And let's not forget the infamous Totenkopf, or the Death's Head insignia, an eerie and ghastly skull that adorned the collar tabs of SS units responsible for administering concentration and extermination camps. This morbid symbol, more than any other, was a stark, graphic representation of the SS's utter disdain for human life. Though skulls had historically been used in military symbolism, in the context of the SS, it adopted a more malevolent meaning, one that unflinchingly stared back at the world, as if to say, we are the architects of death, and we're not ashamed. However, the repertoire of SS symbols wasn't limited to the mystical or the morbid. Flags, anthems and oaths were carefully designed to imbue the organization with a sense of sacred duty. SS marriages and even childbirths were laden with ritualistic elements that aimed at propagating racially pure offspring. Even their infamous black uniforms, designed by SS members Karl Dibitsch and Walter Heck, were not just about aesthetics, but were a representation of the deadly seriousness and cult-like commitment expected from each member. Himmler himself once asserted, Black is our color, black the symbol of battle and of the beginning of all things, and therefore it is good. The Shadow Archive, tracing the SS in the labyrinths of collective memory. The story of the SS does not end with the fall of the Third Reich or the clang of the jailer's keys locking away its criminals. Instead, its legacy unfurls like a dark tapestry across the backdrop of modern history, in the corners of academic research, within the hushed solemnity of memorials, and in the often controversial expanses of public discourse. In academia, the SS serves as a case study for some of the most disquieting questions about human behavior. Scholars laboriously sift through an ocean of archival documents, correspondences, and oral histories to dissect the mechanics of this once feared organization. Ethicists and psychologists, too, grapple with the question of how seemingly ordinary people became agents of unimaginable cruelty. It's an enigma that echoed in the writings of thinkers like Hannah Arendt, whose notion of the banality of evil sought to fathom how institutional frameworks could so effectively dehumanize both the perpetrator and the victim. But while scholars pen volumes, memorials offer a different kind of storytelling, a storytelling of silent contemplation. Places like Auschwitz, Sobibor and Treblinka serve as somber monuments, not just to the victims, but also as indelible marks of the SS's crimes against humanity. Here the narrative is not one of words but of presence, of the haunting emptiness of abandoned barracks and gas chambers, and the weighty silence that settles over fields where thousands were executed. Visitors, including descendants of SS members, often remark on an ineffable sensation, as if the air itself still bears witness to the transgressions that unfolded there. Now venture beyond the hallowed halls of academia and the haunting silence of memorials, and you'll find that the SS also survives in the minefield of public discourse. From Hollywood productions to social media debates, the legacy of the SS is frequently appropriated 
often losing nuance in the process. Films like Schindler's List and The Pianist bring dramatized accounts to global audiences, while others risk trivializing the enormity of SS crimes through stylized violence or warped character arcs. Interestingly, the SS has also been invoked in cautionary tales for contemporary politics, a rhetorical specter warning against the rise of authoritarianism and extremism. Yet this often invites controversy. Critics argue that such comparisons risk diluting the unique horror of the Holocaust and the SS's other crimes. Public memory is, after all, a battleground of interpretation. Just recently, a trend emerged among some far-right groups to co-opt SS symbols or slogans, willfully oblivious or openly disdainful of the weight these carry. These appropriations have ignited societal debates on freedom of speech versus the imperative to counter hate, rekindling old arguments with an urgent new relevance. But perhaps the most poignant markers of the SS's legacy are personal accounts, letters, diaries and interviews with survivors or family members that unveil the microcosms of lives irreparably altered. In these fragments, the SS is not an abstract historical concept but a real tangible force that shattered dreams, separated families, and left wounds that may never fully heal. Dark Echoes. How the SS's haunting ideology reverberates in modern extremism. In the shadowy corners of the internet, hidden in coded language and splayed out in graffiti across nondescript walls, the influence of the SS continues to haunt the modern world. The disturbing allure of their ideology did not crumble with the ruins of the Third Reich. Rather, it metastasized, insinuating itself into various extremist groups that thrive today. To understand this lingering legacy is to peer into a disturbing abyss, where echoes of a past horror reverberate in the language, symbols, and actions of modern hate. From the onset, let's get one thing straight. The infamy of the SS has made it a taboo subject, something to be reviled in mainstream society. Yet paradoxically, that very infamy exerts a pull on the minds captivated by extremist ideologies. What for most is a dark chapter in human history becomes, for some, a playbook, an egregious distortion of history that romanticizes its malevolence. The SS serves not as a cautionary tale, but as an inspiration, a perverse blueprint for pushing forward an agenda that has found new life in modern hate groups. The far right corners of the web are rife with references to the SS, sometimes veiled, sometimes brazen. Websites glorify their struggle. Books by former SS officers are studied as ideological treatises, and images are shared with captions that range from the subtle to the overtly abhorrent. This is where technology's gift of global connection turns into a curse, providing a platform for this twisted fandom to propagate, discuss, and normalize their beliefs. And let's not forget the appropriation of symbols, the runes of the SS, the Totenkopf, or Death's Head, and even their black uniforms have been repurposed by modern hate groups. These symbols still perform the function for which they were designed, to create a sense of inclusion among the initiated while marking a hostile boundary against the other. The chilling sight of the Totenkopf appearing in the insignias of extremist militias is not just a nod to history. It's a conscious effort to link the mission of today's radicals to what they see as a heroic past. Though modern extremist groups may differ in terms of nationality, language, and immediate goals, many share a curious affinity for the SS's distorted view of history and identity. They imbibe theories of racial purity, not as anachronistic nonsense, but as actionable philosophies. In recent years, far-right movements in Europe and America have demonstrated this through a spate of violence targeted against ethnic and religious minorities, echoing the darkest days of the SS. What's even more disturbing is how these ideologies have migrated from the fringes to the mainstream. Political candidates spouting ideas that would have been considered extremist a decade ago are now part of national dialogues, and they use the same playbook, polarize, radicalize, and dehumanize. They may not directly reference the SS, but the ideology is strikingly similar, an in-group defined by race or religion, an existential threat from an invading force. 
and a promise to return to a mythical past. As the screen fades to black, let's sit with the gravity of what we've unearthed today. From the cobbled streets of Munich, where the SS took its first malignant breaths, to the dimly lit corridors of the Nuremberg Trials and into the pixels of modern hate online, the spectre of the SS is a winding river of darkness through the annals of human history. We've encountered the architects of this grim edifice, men like Heinrich Himmler, whose nightmarish visions spilled over into the world, creating ripples of suffering that still touch us today. In a sobering quote, philosopher George Santayana cautioned us, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. As the SS runes, once scribbled on papers outlining horrific war crimes, find new life in the dark corners of the internet, Santayana's words hang in the air like an unheeded prophecy. We are the stewards of memory, the keepers of history, charged with the daunting but vital task of pulling these dark echoes into the light. The story of the SS is over, but its echoes remain, both as a lesson and a warning. It's our responsibility to ensure those echoes fade into silence, never to reverberate again. Thank you for taking this somber journey with me. Let's ensure history remembers so we're not doomed to repeat it.